first and foremost, we all know you have to fly it all the way to the ground. If you stall spin it, stall yaw it, put it in the ground more than 30 degrees down, it's not going to work out. It's that last thousand feet that makes all the difference between you surviving, your passenger surviving, and people on the ground surviving. If you stall spin it into the ground, it's probably not going to work out. So, above all other things, fly the airplane. And we all know that. We've all been taught that. Fly the airplane all the way to the ground. There are other ways we can increase our likelihood of walking away from a forced landing or a crash situation. First, how could this happen? You could run out of fuel. You could have some loss of thrust. Or perhaps even a complete engine failure. Any way you slice it, you're heading to the ground and you got to do something about it. As we teach the fundamentals, A, airspeed, B, best place to land, C, checklist, D, declare, E, exit. Where we stop is where we should keep going. We don't train all the way to the ground. And what that means is to keep you safe, your passengers safe, and people on the ground safe. There's something called crash worthiness. And there's five things that we consider just about the airplane. The acronym is kind of crazy. It's CREEP, right? C CREEP? Yeah, C-R-E-E-P. Okay. The first one, the first letter, C, it stands for container. So this fuselage here, you know, just the, the passenger area, this is our container. We break the container, we break us. Right? Okay. So that's the, that's the thing. Like if you stall spin into the ground, we're going to break the container, we're going to break us, and nothing else matters. All right, this is you. Here's your passenger. And this, this is your airplane. If you don't protect the container, you don't protect you or your passengers or loved ones. If you keep your airplane intact, you have the best chance of survival. And before we get too deep, if you don't mind doing a touch and go on the subscribe button and like button, I'd really appreciate it. R is restraint. Restraint system, and what we call seatbelts. So okay. most GA airplanes these days, if they're you know, modern, they're going to have a lap belt plus a shoulder harness. If you just have a lap belt, your, your odds go way down on survivability. So we want to make sure that we have our seatbelts on, number one, and that they're adjusted properly, right? So we want to make sure they're tight and snug. Just as important as that is we need to make sure that the lap belt, that's tight, is, is down low on the hips, right? Um, because if it's kind of riding up high in our gut, uh -huh. as soon as that, de you know, that deceleration event happens, that seatbelt's going straight back through our gut, which is soft. It's going to okay. hit our spine, and we're going to go forward like this, and you know, you're going to have a lot more chance of injury skeletal system take a lot of force and pressure. Our gut, our you know vital organs, they cannot. So we got to make sure that our seat belt is tight and it's low. So make sure you check that with your passengers too. Different airplanes have different types of restraint systems. If you just have a lap belt, that's clearly the worst. The next best would be the three-point system, right, where you have a lap belt and a shoulder strap. More modern airplanes have a four or five point harness system or restraint system. That is even better than the three point system. E and just the crash worthiness piece is energy. We're not talking about the energy that we're gonna land at. We're talking about the energy of the airplane and how is the airplane going to help dissipate the energy. Okay. So in our one seventy two, we've got our you know our, our cowling out here with our engine that's gonna take some force. You know, our gear may take some you know, take some of the impact. Hopefully. So I've got some struts and wings that may, may as well. How airplanes are constructed can help with the dissipation of that energy. For good examples of how the airframes are des designed to take some of that energy out of a crash, we can look at ag aviation. Flight deck or cockpit, it's recessed, right? There's a lot of room between the cockpit and the front of the airplane. They've got a roll cage. They also have military-style restraint systems. Designers spend a lot of time to ensure that energy dissipation and safety was part of the design. And the next E in creep is environment. When we think about a crash or force landing event, our whole movement of our hand, like my hand could, could easily hit this, right? My head could right. easily hit, you know, the side, right? It, it could whip back. Like, where all can your body go? That's kind of that, it's called the flail movement or the, you know, the flail area. Something, you know, a force landing event could invoke rapid or extreme movement could be, you know, potentially deadly, right? I mean, beyond a broken limb or whatnot, but, you know, if there's something that's on the dash that's sticking out or you're too close to the dash, um, you certainly could could uh, do yourself some damage. So in the event of a force landing also, you're going to want to do a couple things. Like, one, 
like you want to keep your legs and feet within the the, the seat track system in our air, in our okay. Uh, our airplane, so we usually right? sit like this. Yeah. That's so we'll, no good. If we if we're you know our legs are spread open like this, this could certainly impact us. That would be right. no good. Okay. There's a broken knee or worse, broken leg. And then as you're coming in for landing, like <laughs> certainly you're going to fly the airplane all the way there. Like a lot of people hold the yoke like this, right? Okay. Don't do that because if this yoke jams back, you're probably going to lose. Okay. <laughs> break a thumb. So just hold it like that, right? You can still fly like that. If we're coming down, like we want to get away from the panel as far as we can. So we're going to scoot our seats, scoot our seat back. We're going to move our seats aft. If you, you know, especially if your passengers can can move back some, that would that would help. Okay. If you can too, you should. The rapid deceleration that happens during a crash can cause the occupants to flail. That means your limbs, your head, anything that's not restrained is going to move. All right. So if you know you're going down. There's a brace position that you should put yourself into, right. and your passengers. And yes, there, it's got, it's it's a myth that people think that they can actually hold themselves by pushing on the dash. You know, a vent like that that's not going to work. Let's say you have a you know we have a shoulder harness here. You want to put one thumb in the shoulder harness, right? And then the other you're going to hold on tight with that, and the other arm, the other hand is going to be you know on your arm. You want to put your head in this V right here, right? Okay. That's going to be your preferred position for, for for impact. And the reason that we do that, because if we're going to stop suddenly, if we're just sitting up straight, we're trying to hold ourselves, we, our, your head's going forward, right? Uh -huh. It's going to go forward. So we're, at least if we're bracing like this, we're going to stop that, at least that head forward movement. The head may go back once we stop, but at least you're stopping half of that, you know, that whiplash effect that could really uh, do some, do you wrong. If you were to have a four-point or five-point system, you'd want to put both of your hands and and thumbs behind the harness and hold on that way. Last thing, just to have a lap belt only, hold your arms and still use the V, right? Okay. Even though you don't have anything to hold on to. So part of the environment consideration of crashworthiness is delethalizing things that could potentially strike you. If you look at modern designs, they have a nice padded dash. The instruments and air vents are recessed. It was designed that way, so there's less of a chance of those things impacting you or your passenger. And the last letter in creep is P, which is post-flight factors. What can we do ahead of time to make sure once we get on the ground, we're going to be okay? So what do we think about? We think about source of combustion, right? We want to make sure the fuel is shut off, yeah. our condition is off. Hopefully there's no chance of combustion or a fire. Beyond that, we may be, tur we may, we may be turned upside down. But just for illustration purposes, I bought a roll of seatbelt. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take off my shoulder belt just for a second. Okay. Because what can happen after you, let's say you have a forced landing or a crash, and you get stuck, that's not good, right? right. It's, you cannot tear a seatbelt apart. So a little $2 tool like this on Amazon, this could be the difference between life and death. So let's do a little simulation. All right. I've got my seatbelt on, right, and, and we're upside down and, you know, the thing's jammed. This little thing in no time goes oh. like that. So easy. So two bucks. Two bucks. Okay. If you want to get really expensive? You can go for the ten dollar variety, which has a little knockout tool, which we we're talking about earlier. Like, could you knock something like out? Get out. Yeah, you could probably kick it out, but you know, this little hammer could do the deal. This is ten bucks on Amazon. So. This will what? It'll crack it or something yep. later. Yeah, and crack it, it or whatnot. The other thing about this one, it's got the seatbelt thing in there too. So that taut. There you go. I was gonna say, I think the two dollar one works better. Yeah. <laughs> the the post crash thought process, we have to think about exit or egress ahead of time. You and I are in a two two seat, or oh, sorry, two door one seventy two. We're in a Cherokee, or we're in a one one door. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're in a Grumman. You know, we've got a canopy there, right? A Cirrus has the two, you know, doors that open differently. A real pilot in command is thinking about that ahead of time. I've got four people in here. How are we going to get out? Is that part of my exit briefing? Different airplanes have different configurations. How many people do you have with you and what's your exit plan? And that's the kind of thing you might want to practice ahead of time or at least think about. I always fly with a personal locator beacon, so if you have one of these, definitely this will be a good time to hit that uh, SOS button and see if they come for you. But, oh, you uh, want to? Okay, let's. 
If you push the button, they are supposed to come get you wherever you are in the world. So I'll take it. What are other ways that we can increase survivability in GA? The auto industry has saved thousands of lives with airbags, but general aviation has not widely adopted an airbag system. However, they are available. There's some manufacturers and vendors out there that are producing commercially available airbag systems for airplanes, for GA. Another way going forward we can stay safe is if you're a Cirrus pilot, pull the chute. The Cirrus Airframe Parachute System, or CAPS, has saved hundreds of lives. The good news for other GA pilots is ballistic recovery systems also make chutes that can be installed on dozens of different types of GA airplanes. From 172s to RVs to Diamonds, they can be installed as well. Another way to increase survivability that we don't do really in GA is helmets. Helmets are widely used by our military, by our police. It's going to take a major change in public acceptance before we start wearing helmets in GA. If you got a little something out of this video, I'd appreciate the thumbs up and subscribe. Safe flying, everybody. All right. November 6, World 129, runway 7, good land. Is that two landings? Or one? November 3, X-ray, echo.